Welcome to Health System CIO's Partner Perspective Interview Series. Today we're talking with Chelsea Wyatt, Principal at the Chartist Group about the 21st Century Cures Act and some of its upcoming deadlines. Chelsea, thanks for joining us. You bet. Thanks for having me, Anthony. All right. It's going to be a fun chat. We're going to cover a lot of ground. Why don't we start off, uh, if you want to tell us a little bit about Chartist Group and your role there. Happy to. Uh, so Chartist is really a healthcare consulting firm. We provide comprehensive advisory services, analytic services, and so much more to the healthcare industry across the board. Um, we go through strategic planning, performance excellence, informatics and technology. We've got a great digital practice, health analytics practice, and a clinical quality practice too that's been number one in class for a long time. And we work with academic medical centers, with integrated delivery networks, children's hospitals, medical groups, and a lot of other healthcare service organizations as they navigate the healthcare industry. Um, I am a principal with the Charters Group, so I'm one of our junior partners helping lead a couple of different service lines for us, including our implementation advisory services service line and our service line for the 21st Century Cures Act. So excited to talk to you all about interoperability today. Okay, very good. So in preparing for this interview, I started to do a little research. You know, sometimes I don't look at these things as deeply as I should. Uh, and we were talking about uh, deadlines of November 2nd, and I found some graphic uh, graph illustration with the deadlines and all that. And okay, oh, that's what November 2nd means. That's the, it was at the six month deadlines, and it just worked right. out to November 2nd. So um, I probably like many CIOs, uh, was not paying too much attention. And we'll get into the reasons why they weren't paying too much attention, but um, sept uh, November 2nd is coming up. So what do we want them to know? Uh, we assume they know something, but what do, what, what do you want to call out to them? Like, hey, heads up, <laughs> stuff's coming. Here's yeah. what you need to do. Absolutely. So the interoperability has been around for a while, right? They right. started really fostering it in 2004 with the creation of the Office of the National Coordinator, whose whole purpose is to foster interoperability. And so as we kind of progress through the ARA and the High Tech Act set up and got everybody established to have electronic health records, but nobody was still sharing data. You had these little information pockets of different vendors. And so the 21st Century Cures Act was passed in 2016 to say, you really need to, to foster interoperability. And interoperability is how we're going to have a very healthy health ecosystem. We need to prohibit information blocking, which is restricting, preventing, or discouraging any access of the patient's electronic health information. And so what just came up is how do we enact the 21st Century Cures Act, which is with the ONC and CMS interoperability rules, which were published on March 9th of this year, and our, uh, the compliance dates are coming into effect November 2nd of this year. So it's less than 60 days away now. Um, so big impact for provider organizations with these deadlines. There's a lot of things that they really need to do. Um, there are three covered actors that are under the requirements uh, for information blocking, which are provider organizations, health information networks, or health information exchanges, and then healthcare IT developers. Um, most of these covered actors also have requirements beyond information blocking, but that's the biggest one that's coming up for November 2nd. So what that means is that healthcare providers need to make sure to look at all their workflows and all of their policies to make sure that they're not blocking patient information. And what's amazing about this is it's such a huge mindset change, Anthony, from where we mm -hmm. were, right. which was HIPAA was restricting all of the information and what you could share with other provider organizations about patients. Now the mindset's totally changed and we really need to open up and share information with anybody that's an authorized reporter. That includes the patients themselves, that includes third parties, and what's transformative about this is it's really enabling patients to be the uh, center of their own care. Is it possible that 
Um, so when you think of information blocking, you think of the vendors typically uh, right. in terms of this is what it's about to prevent vendors from saying, hey, you've got to pay a lot of money if you want your data to go from here to there. So it's information blocking by charging exorbitant fees. Essentially, you're extorting people, whatever, you know, right. not to put in crazy terms, but, you know, but you don't think of it a lot with providers, except right. to the effect of, again, they make it maybe difficult, right? So um, talk a little bit about that, the fact that providers are on the hook here, and it might look very different. Yeah. Uh, providers not information blocking might look very different than a vendor not information blocking. So right. tell me a little bit about what exactly they can't do that they might not think is a problem. Sure. So absolutely. There are vendor requirements too under these rules when it comes to information blocking, but those aren't enacted quite as early as the provider okay. requirements. So those okay. healthcare IT vendors you mentioned, mm -hmm. they're considered developers under the rule mm -hmm. and they have a lot of requirements too. They've got to share um, and, and be able to share patient data via APIs. They've got to become a certified healthcare IT uh, platform. There's a lot of additional requirements that these rules have now related to providers. Instead of sharing what they had to share before, which was just the clinical common data set, it really gets enhanced. They have to share a new data set called USCDI, and that is including things like clinical notes. Uh, and, and all of that is imaging notes and procedure notes and everything as well. So there's an enhanced requirement from providers in terms of what they need to share and their requirements are earlier than what developers' requirements are. So in that little stopgap period, Anthony, they need to figure out how do we make sure we're not information blocking because our vendors aren't required to have everything in the system in place yet. So we need to create workflows and policies to make sure that we're okay from a provider perspective by November 2nd. So there could be, uh, um, as, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking there could be easy stuff and there could be hard stuff. So you go right. through the list and you go, oh yeah, check. Yeah, we got that. Or, oh, that's easy. And then right. there could be something that you look at and go, I don't even know how we're going to do that. <laughs> so, so uh, do we have the gamut? Does it run the gamut in terms of oh, the yeah. things? That is there stuff in there that really takes months and months to yeah. affect? Absolutely. So it really depends on a lot of our clients in terms of how far they are in the progression of this and being able to meet the requirements of information blocking. Um, there's a lot of things to consider. So you've got things like open notes where clinical notes now have to be shared. As I mentioned, you're going to have to make sure that you have information in those notes that's applicable and correct and not outdated, that other folks can make clinical decisions on that, those notes. You're going to have to be sure your providers understand and know how those notes are going to be shared. So there's a lot of groups that are impacted just by that one potential component. Then you look at other things like results release, um, like making sure that you have a method to receive patient data requests and a method to respond to patient data requests so that you're meeting all of the requirements of the rules without having to regularly use an exception to information blocking. Um, there's a lot to consider across the board and a lot to set up for this. It makes me think of uh, you know my kids with uh, school, <laughs> right? So you say, if they fall behind, they're just in big trouble because you, you right. have to know this foundational stuff if you're gonna learn the advanced stuff. It sounds like that's what's going on with health systems. Yes. You know, you said based on where they are is how much they have to do, but it's never gonna end. So you really gotta catch up at some point. Right. Or it's just gonna get harder and harder. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely does. And we're hearing from some uh, clients that you know they push back the information blocking requirements initially from April already to six months. We're getting requests from clients saying, are they gonna push it back further? Uh, right now, there's no indication that they are. And so we're really saying you need to make sure that you're enabling your organization to be at least compliant with these rules. And then what's kind of incredible about this, that some forward looking organizations can do is you can go far above and beyond compliance. You can look at this as a strategic opportunity. So you really can 
ensure that you're enabling the patient and giving the patient the ability to manage their own care by providing them the data. And what we've seen from some different surveys, including a Blackbrook survey that just came out, is patients really want that. They're saying that two thirds of them will actually switch and not use their current healthcare provider and maybe go to a different provider or a different physician if they feel like their information's being blocked. So the onus of ensuring that you're not information blocking really does lie with the provider organizations. And if you get ahead of this and talk to patients and say, we are gonna be an enabler for your healthcare experience, we're gonna be able to get you this data very effectively, that could be a competitive advantage. And how incredible would that be? Yeah. So obviously Chartis is providing services around helping organizations get ready for these kind of right. things. So at a high level, let's talk about costs involved, not, not specific Chartist costs, but sure. um, costs of compliance um, is, and we know we'll, we'll get into more about uh, the financial situation that health systems are in right now. Right. Um, but overall, do you associate big dollars with getting into compliance with some of the stuff? Yeah, um, you know, I think that answer is it depends as well. It depends on how far you are as an organization itself, mm -hmm. and then how much you want to invest in ensuring that you're promoting interoperability, or do you just want to be compliant? Um, we've heard from a few of our health system CIOs that they're planning to spend anywhere between a half a million dollars to about one and a half million dollars over the next few years to ensure that they're compliant with the rules. Others are really thinking of this again as a strategic opportunity. Uh, and where that money goes is really maybe establishing an interoperability steering committee to figure out how you're going to respond to compliance, how you're gonna start your strategy, becoming educated on the rules across your organization, not just within your C-suite and delivering that education across the enterprise so that everyone understands the rules and the changes for compliance making sure that you socialize a communication plan too internally and with your patients and potentially third parties and then really looking at your current contracts with third party organizations your policies the data flow you already have and then any interoperability processes as well as your strategy around digital and other things that touch on interoperability and identify gaps that exist. Then you wanna create a plan to, to how do I plug those gaps? And that's what we help organizations with. Uh, we also help connect them with third party legal advice too. And we've got a couple of firms that are just mm. fantastic in this area to do that. Yeah, I mean, half the battle here is figuring out exactly what you have to do, right? Exactly. Understanding the law, the regulations, right. and then that you know current state and then the gap analysis, right? And there are some major nuances to the laws. And right now there seem to be a lot more questions than there are answers. We think mm -hmm. as this progresses, that's really gonna progress. But again, definitely something you wanna get in front of. You don't wanna be the last kid in the class. Oh man, I'll tell you. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, interoperability committee. Is this, this is definitely in your opinion, this is right in the CIO's wheelhouse. They have to head this up or do you see it being yeah. Uh, hand it off to someone who reports to the CIO, or is it not even directly in IT in terms sure. of who's got to lead up compliance with the Cures Act? So I'm glad you asked that because this is one of the largest complications of implementing interoperability. It really needs to be across the organization, Anthony. There's mm -hmm. so many key players that have to be involved. Uh, so although the onus of responsibility may largely fall on the CIO, because this is an IT area, right? to meet the compliance with the ONC and the CMS rules, the efforts are gonna take a village. So even small components of the compliance requirement like sharing clinical notes touches groups uh, from HIM and current release of information processes to physician advisory groups, to training, to compliance, to the patient experience group. There's gonna have to be a lot of operational workflow and process changes as well as items within IT so your operations team needs to be very involved. Sounds like a lot. Uh, and we know that health systems have been dealing with a lot. Um, what do you think the, 
what do you think the effect has been, the COVID effect on this? I mean, do you imagine that organizations would be much further along with this if not for COVID? You know, we've obviously done lots of interviews and, and things in that area. And it's been a 100%, at least for three mo- two months, three months of time, it was 100% of their focus. Um, so what do you think the effect has been? Yeah, so these rules came out at at just a difficult time. Um, And although interoperability had been in the works for a long time, the rules were, um, came out on March 9th of this year. And then the final rule was published on May 1st. And so if you look at the timeframe of that, it, it was literally a week before the pandemic really began to sweep the country. A huge impact when it comes to distraction of CAOs and everyone else across the provider organizations, a lot of our clients had to split their organization almost in two and have one organization that was keeping the lights on and delivering all of the incredible care they already were. The other part of the organization was standing up and dealing with how do we become a hospital that can handle all of these COVID-19 patients. So they already had that large distraction this is going to be a, a big impact then because of that. And a lot of our clients are saying, how did I not know about this? Well, it's because of the time frame in terms of how this came out. Um, about 10% of the organizations we've talked to, the CIOs really had no idea that this was something that they needed to comply with. Uh, and there's others that had some things in the works, but they're not nearly as far along. Yeah, so it's it's very interesting. So, and then you have, uh, as you mentioned, the financial pressures from the loss okay. of revenue from COVID, and again, this having a dollar amount associated with it, um, yeah. that's another issue, right? Absolutely. They have the money. They have the bucks to do it. Yeah. And we've seen a lot of the demand for our provider organizations largely come back lately, but there was a huge dip following right. um, the onset of the pandemic in this country and a lot of folks are still 20 percent off of their regular revenue numbers Um, we've got a great performance and strategy group that helps evaluate how do we improve those types of financial metrics too Um, but this is definitely a an additional item that needs to be budgeted for um, and taken care of as folks are finishing out this year and then getting into next year and it's something that we think is going to pay dividends in the future, but, but definitely has a bit of an impact. Do you have any sense? Uh, I know you mentioned you haven't heard anything about delays in the deadlines, but um, it almost seems stunning that they would keep the original dead. If this was the original deadline yeah. and, it, you know, in light of what's happened, that they would keep it and people are hoping and praying, but I guess that's not a strategy. Right. <laughs> no, it's not an effective strategy. It's not no. one that we suggest our clients use. Um, the deadlines actually were pushed back six months. Um, so Dr. Okay. Rucker with the ONC came in and, and has already pushed back the compliance deadlines to November 2nd of this year. So those are already six months delayed. We're not anticipating a future delay. Um, what is interesting, though, is that there are uh, impacts that have been designated in terms of financial impacts for healthcare um, information exchanges and for developers. And so it's a million dollars per transaction for any information blocking event. Those financial impacts have not been stipulated when it comes to provider organizations. So we are expecting that there's going to be a final rule that comes out from the ONC, and that'll be sometime after the November 2nd date. Um, We're hearing from some of our legal partners, but they're not expecting that to be retroactive, Uh, but there should be an enforcement date that comes out then, which gives civil monetary penalties for provider organizations, and that's what hasn't been stipulated yet. So there's not gonna be any carrot for this, uh, the carrot was really the funds that came out for Ara and high tech. This is now the stick saying that that was intended to make sure we were fostering interoperability and, and we really need you to. And if you don't, here's the, um, the impact that's going to come down. That's always fun. Just the yeah. carrot. <laughs> it's the stick. We, they got right, the carrot right. a while back. Do it's, you, you know, too this, bad, yeah. this is something that, you know, just, um, 
just to debate it a little bit, you know, do you think that the uh, High Tech Act and the way they went about it, just pushing out the electronic medical records and focusing on that in terms of meaningful use, I know it was a lot, it was a financial crisis and we had the big stimulus package and all that and it was a rush to figure out how to spend the money. Do you see there was a missed opportunity there in terms of integrating more interoperability initiatives with that mass rollout of yeah. EHRs? Yeah, I think the difficulty is that a lot of players in the industry thought that if we got everybody up on EHRs and it was pervasive, the interoperability would just naturally follow. And, you know, nobody had done this before. Everyone was working on paper. So I think the, the interesting impact of all of this is that didn't follow and that there were these pockets of vendors and, and different players who realized how valuable this data was and that they didn't want to share it with one another. And they were almost looking at patient data, their IP. And so now it's a really fantastic force that's happening in the industry where the government's saying, you need to share this. It's in the patient's best interest. It's in your best interest as well. And so here are the, the methods for how we're going to make sure that this happens because it didn't happen before. So I've heard very, very intelligent people who I respect a lot swear to me that information blocking is a myth. Very bright people. And I've heard just as bright people say information blocking is absolutely real and happens. Yeah. Yeah. So what, which is it? Yeah, I mean, we've seen a lot of instances of information blocking definitely occurring. I think in some instances, uh, organizations think that it really is in the best interests of the patient and they're doing it for patient safety reasons, um, or they're doing it because information wasn't shared with the, the patient by the provider, and that's just the better method for doing it. There's other areas where I think there has been information blocking in an attempt to ensure that there's a lack of competition in the industry. And I think what's so incredible about these rules is it's going to potentially generate a whole new frontier where there's going to be third party organizations that are disruptive organizations that can then come in and with the patient's assent get access to this healthcare data and do so much with it that's mm -hmm. going to help further healthcare than we've seen or that the main EHR vendors would possibly be able to do. Um, and the EHR vendors have been doing a lot in this space too to, to really foster great patient care but I don't think they can do it alone. And so now we are gonna have patients managing their own care without having huge stacks of patient records printed out. And we're gonna have third party organizations helping with very innovative methods of looking at patient data like we've never had before. So you've got, you know, you've got the three constituencies, the providers, and then you've got the developers slash vendors uh, and okay. HIEs, correct? Those, correct? those are the three? Those are the three um, factors. So the, any, anything uh, you want to say regarding the developers, vendors, you said their, their deadlines are further out. Um, okay. any, any heads up you want to give those folks? Yeah, um, so I think they're very on top of it. From talking with yeah. a couple of the major EHR vendors, they've got some great informational uh, webinars that they've done with their clients. They've got some, some great information that they're sharing. They're already doing development to make sure that they're in compliance. Uh, and they've actually been part of the conversation and the feedback to create these final rules. Before the final rules came out March 9th, there was actually an entire year where folks were able to give feedback on how the rules were going to be constructed. And a lot of the developers took uh, part in, in responding to that. And that's why the final rules are so long. It's yeah. 1,244 pages and 450 pages because it includes a lot of those comments. Right. So I, I wouldn't suggest having that as bedtime reading. <laughs> no, unless you want to go to bed. It'll help True. you fall asleep. True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But folks like us can help you all interpret that. <laughs> right. That's right. Um, yeah, well, you, I would imagine that the vendors are, are a little better at dealing with this, right, than the providers who are dealing with patients, right, and COVID and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So I think there's fewer imagine. distractions. Um, yeah. And I think it's something that maybe they were a little bit more prepared for, and they have whole teams of people to take care of. 
uh, you know, provider organizations aren't just our big hospital systems, it's everything down to your neighborhood self-employed physician. So there's going to be a lot of folks that need to come up with a strategy on how to manage this. Let's talk a little bit about security. You mentioned, you know, these are, these are rules being put into place to foster interoperability, to move data from here to there. And you mentioned HIPAA almost as being prohibitive of moving data, right? That was one of the reasons people cited for not moving data from here to there. So um, well, I've, heard, I've heard security uh, executives, healthcare security executives talk about the challenge they face in being responsible for protecting data but yet having to manage things like these interoperability initiatives. So protect it, you know, and which kind of implies locking it down, keeping it safe, but mm -hmm. you have to send it to anybody who wants it all over the place now. So they're in a tough spot. Um, how do you see this security factoring to all this? And maybe your thoughts yeah. on IT executives working with their CISOs to make sure they're sharing, but sharing safely. Right. So it's a very good point. Um, you know, we talked with our security experts within Partis, and the good news is for security that there are security audits organizations are already submitting um, are surrounding HIPAA and surrounding existing interoperability requirements. So that's going to meet the needed security requirements for this. But you're right, that does open up the data to a whole new group of users, to patients and to third party organizations. One of the biggest things to note for provider organizations, though, is that once the data leaves their doors securely and to an authorized recipient, those are the big things they have to make sure it is happening, that the recipient's authorized and that it's leaving securely. It's specified in the rules that it's no longer their responsibility what happens to the data beyond that. Mm -hmm. So that's very good to note. Um, this is a big area of potential uh, consumer education too, though, because they need to understand who they're authorizing to have their data and what that organization may do with it. And then um, one of the other largest impacts to provider organizations are that the ONC rule stipulated that application programming interfaces or APIs are what is gonna be used to kind of be the messenger to transmit patient data in the future. So what the rules suggest is that the application developers should use these to minimize the special effort needed to transmit patient data. And so provider organizations may want to look at how do we make an API that complies with that requirement and communicates with outside organizations as well. Um, and the standard communication for those language that uh, those APIs is specified as being HL7 fire. So the rules try to make it a little bit easier in terms of how are you going to communicate with other organizations. One of the biggest things to look at, though, is how are you going to qualify who is an, an authorized recipient or not? Right. And right. how are you going to educate your patients that once that data leaves your hands, um, they really need to understand what they can use for it. It's a good point because I think a lot of patients won't think of it that way intuitively. I, I gave it to you, right. uh, but, but the way it is in reality is it's a bit of a hot potato, right? right. I, I threw it over here and I, I verified who it was, but out of my hands, I passed it off. Absolutely. But the patient is, you know, it, unless they're educated, as you said, they're, they're going to look at the health system and say, I gave it to you and now there's a problem, not, you know, it was passed along type thing. Right. So there may need to be updates to policies um, or patient releases that you put into place as a provider organization to account for that as well. Yeah. Yep. All right. I think we covered a lot of ground. Is there anything else you want to touch on? Any final message to, um, you know, CIOs and other executives that are listening and uh, hopefully not being too woken up by this <laughs> and hopefully they did have some idea of what's going on, but maybe the deadlines crept up on them a little bit. I don't know. Is there a, uh, um, you know, a cramming for the test type thing they can do? Yeah. I mean, the biggest things are going to be look at your organization and determine whether you first just want to comply with the rules or whether you want to go above and beyond. Um, you're already doing so many things as a provider organization that are very strategic, right? You're probably coming up with an overall digital strategy. 
way you're probably um, looking at a lot of workflows and making changes to those workflows and processes. What we're suggesting is if you're already doing all of those actions, make sure that you're incorporating the knowledge that these interoperability rules are out and that these are the requirements, because then maybe you just have to touch those workflows once. Mm -hmm. Or maybe when you come up with your digital strategy, you can incorporate interoperability too. And then the last closing words of wisdom I would have is that there's some major benefits to this for patients and families. Uh, we think that it's gonna show that there's a greater understanding of patient medical conditions. There's gonna be enhanced trust in their physician and in their provider organization. Patients are gonna feel more in control of their care. And what we're seeing from studies that have been done at UPNC and other areas is that there's actually more demand for additional and future services once patients have the information. And so it could be an, an increase in patient traffic and an increase in the strength of the relationship that you have with your patients that comes from uh, making sure that you really comply with the rules very well. So it sounds like what, uh, a big message you're giving out is um, if you have any capacity to go beyond basic compliance, do so, or at least try and position yourself to be ready to do so, because you're going to have to do a lot of work to get into compliance. And if you just think it out a little more or do a little bit more, you're going to get some real strategic benefits, competitive benefits. Exactly. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Well, um, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. It was great to talk to you. This was wonderful. Great to talk to you as well. All right. Take care. You too. Thank you.